screen, thanks to the wonders of technology. Yep, drum roll, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Yay, there we go. Okay, hey. so good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for coming, especially to those of you here in the live audience. Thanks to COVID, Dr. Carl couldn't be here. So all you have in person is this. So I'm very flattered that you still came anyway. And thank you and hello to everyone on the, uh, in the world of Zoom right now. It's great to have you here virtually. So my name's Ollie Dove and I am the MC for tonight. And I'd like to open and begin this evening with an acknowledgement of country. So I acknowledge and honor the traditional and original owners of the space in which we're meeting, the Palawa people of Lichuita. So I honor elders past, present, emerging, and the Aboriginal people that did not make elder status. I acknowledge the history and the impact that colonization and invasion had on Aboriginal peoples, including the forceful removal from their lands. And I honor the original and first Australian scientists, not just for Science Week, but every single week. And I also honor those who care for country today. And importantly, also honor the traditional owners of the land from where the people tuning in are. So for those of you here in the audience, the live audience, I have some very exciting housekeeping news for you. So thanks to COVID and the world of COVID, you would have had to do your temperature checks and all of those lovely things. So thank you very much for complying with that. If there is an emergency, you can see two lovely fluorescent green exit signs. So the easiest one is probably the way you came back in. Um, so just make your way safely and calmly. And speaking of emergencies, if anyone needs the toilet, they are out that door, turn right, down the staircase, only go one flight to your left, to your left again. Now we're gonna be talking about science this evening, but it's not a science classroom where you're stuck to your seat. So feel free to go anytime you need. I think that's it for all of that stuff. So I'll just introduce myself again. So I'm Ollie Dove and appropriately for my name, I study the behavior of birds. I'm a PhD student at the Institute for Marine and Antarctic Studies down in Salamanca, and I study the behavior of little penguins and short-tailed shearwaters living here in Tasmania. Aside from that, I play footy, AFL footy. A couple of my teammates are here this evening. Uh, <laughs> shout out to the Uni Rainbows. Um, and those of you, you may be able to see, I actually have a scratch from the match this morning on my face. Um, and also aside from that, I am a radio and podco podcast host and editor for That's What I Call Science. So we're a, we're a weekly um, radio show and each week we interview a different STEM professional that works here in Tasmania. So we cover all of science, technology, engineering, maths and medicine. And if you want to know any more about it, catch me afterwards. I also have some lovely cards and bumper stickers if anyone wants, because who doesn't like free merchandise? But you didn't come here or tune in to listen to me talk. You came here for this guy. So this is Dr. Carl. You, he probably needs no introduction. You all know who he is. Well-known science communicator. You probably heard him on Triple J. And he also has a lot of books out, one currently on climate change. So without further ado, please join me in a warm round of applause for our speaker of the evening, Dr. Carl. Hi, hello. Is that awfully kind of you? And hello you, to you lovely people there in the audience. So let's go into the screen share mode. And here we go. And does the volume change enormously? Not that much. And take this guy down to here. And let's hit it with a bit of luck. Can you tell me if you're seeing a picture, a movie of a whale shark? Is that what you're seeing, Dr. Ollie? Yeah, we see the whale shark. That's it. So that's off um, Christmas Island. And you're thinking, why are they so huge and yet so calm? And that fits in really well with this whole theme of National Science Week this year of get curious because it's the and it's not the answer that gets you the Nobel Prize, it's the question. 
So hello, I'm Dr. Carl. Um, anybody listen to me on Triple J or follow me on TikTok? I love you very much. I almost I love you almost as much as um, everybody else as well. So I want you to love me because I'm very shallow. And I know from the media that I have to start off with a fluffy cat story, but the internet is just crawling with cute cat videos. So instead I went for something almost as cute, a dinosaur story. Or did I? Ah. So the story is that these pterosaurs are flying two-legged dinosaurs. Well, okay. They were flying, but they were not two-legged and they were not dinosaurs. They were a different sort of animal. They were around at the same time as the dinosaurs a couple of hundred million years ago. So pterosaur, dinosaurs, it does sound right, but they're different. So here's a photograph I took with my secret time machine. Oops, sorry. Government secret. Forget anything I told you. So you can see these guys taking off. It's actually from the Scientific American. That's the cover story. And if you look down in the bottom left-hand corner, you'll see that they've got two feet hitting the ground. And what looks suspicious is like a couple of feet hanging in the air there. And then um, if you look at this next one here, you can see, yep, they're looking like four-legged creatures again. Now, as you know, everything runs in threes, the rule of threes, three sides to a triangle. And in country music, there are three days of the week, yesterday, today, and tomorrow, each one worse than the one before it. So here's our third graphic. And okay, that is definitely a four-legged creature zooming in on the feet, four-legged. So pterosaurs were not two-legged. They were, in fact, the first vertebrates to fully properly fly. And they had many evolutionary adaptations. So here's kind of an overview. Now let's just dive in and have a look at the head. And you see all of that internal bracing holding it together. Oh, man, that's so clever. And then we get the big picture and then dive into another part, into the wing. Well. It's not a wing of feathers. It's a sort of a leathery skin membrane. But look, there's all these special things in there like muscles and blood vessels and actinofibrils and all that sort of stuff. So there were many different types of these pterosaurs and many different lifestyles. And they were different from us in many ways. So in my case, you see, I've got a head here and a neck. My neck and head makes up maybe one fifth, one sixth of my total body length. For these guys, it was three quarters. And the trunk, which is about half my body length, was only a quarter. So these guys are huge. Look at that. See that long head. And you know, see the, the very long neck over here and the head and this tiny little trunk. So these guys, they were literally, literally the flying jaws of death. Chomp, chomp, chomp. Being dive bombed by a magpie is bad enough, but this is a much higher level of death, doom, and destruction. Check out this guy and his big teeth. Okay, all her big teeth. They are big teeth. There's even a tongue in there just to sort of, I don't know why. So pterosaurs were huge critters, like 10 metres long and weighing quarter of a tonne. Now, as you know, everything is really handy and easy to understand if you're related to something else. And I'm a big fan of the blue people in their art. So here's a blue person. And compare that blue person to one of the biggest pterosaurs. Oh, my heavens. Roughly the size of a Cessna 172 plane and a little bit bigger. These pterosaurs were bigger than an F-16 fighter. Man, they were huge. They were very, they had a very strong and very light skeleton because, you know, if you want to fly, you've got to be light. And that membrane they had, it actually provided more lift than wings. And they had a really nice combination to get off the ground of haunch, launch, power, which I'll explain to you in just a second, and they had really short, powerful rear legs and very long front legs. And just check out that leg action there, man. Imagine how these people would have performed in the Olympic long jump or high jump. So let's go through their five stages of takeoff. In their first stage, you can see that the back leg is straight and the front leg is bent, but then in the crouch position, front and back legs are then bent. They then move into the vault and notice how the back leg is now straight. So it's pushing them off the ground. Front leg is still bent and then the front leg begins to straighten and there it is fully straightened and they've gone into the full launch. That's how they took off these monsters of the Mesozoic skies. They were then, but not now. This is a beautiful, um, extinct, oh, sorry, excellent pterosaur skeleton. You can see the front legs and the back legs there. But there's a bit of a mystery there. 
why were the pterosaurs extinct? Because the birds didn't go extinct and neither did the reptiles like crocodiles and alligators. So why did the pterosaurs go extinct? We don't know. Luckily, however, one beautiful creature is not extinct and we're talking the biggest creature ever to have existed, the blue whale. Now, to put it in perspective, once again, we'll use a picture of a little tiny human and there's the blue whale. These were really big. And here's something really surprising. I'll bet you a dollar, you didn't know this, but whales, whales, you know how they were almost driven to extinction. Whales were saved by, wait for it, fossil fuel. Wow. You see, back then, way there in the early days, when they were getting the industrial revolution going, whale oil was essential for heating and lubrication and light. And yes, then they came up with crude oil, fossil fuels, which saved the whales for ex from extinction because crude oil could do absolutely everything that whale oil could do, and it was easier to get to. It could do everything that whale oil could do, except for, wait for it, here come three words I bet you never heard together in your life, lubricate uranium bombs. Wow, okay, that sounds pretty weird. Okay, so let's start with the easy part, the uranium bomb part. So there's a bomb taking off, uh, exploding, and there's a big flash, and then there's a wind. Okay, let's have a look at this more closely. Okay, so there's um, a big flash. Oh, look, there's a bit of smoke rise, ah, and then there's a wind. Hang on, there's something weird going here with the smoke. Let's have another look. So then there's the smoke. Oh, there's a flash of light, the smoke, and then the wind. And then, okay, smoke, and then the wind. What's going on there? Well, have a look here. You see the big flash of light travels at the speed of light. And in that light is a lot of heat. So the heat gets the wooden building in virtually no time at all and starts heating it up and it starts burning. And the smoke goes vertically upwards until a second or two later, the wind comes. And there's one thing I am 100% sure of. Those tenants of that building Man, they're not getting their uh, bond money back. No way. Okay, so we've been, we've got to the uranium bombs part. What do I mean by lubricate uranium bombs? Well, it turns out that a whale oil, sperm whale oil, was an essential lubricant for the, now here's another complicated phrase, sliding uranium-235 subcritical slug. Well, there's different types of uranium. And uh, uranium-235 is the only one that goes bang. So let's have a look at where this uranium-235 might be sliding. So here's your old-fashioned uranium bomb, also called the barrel. Uh, and you can see that there's um, different things inside. There's a bit of explosive there, right? Uh, and you make that go bang. And then um, the cordite turns into gas and it pushes on this hollow cylinder of uranium-235. Notice that there are three rings of uranium put together. We can talk about that later if you want. There's various reasons for that. And then, whoops, what's that red arrow doing? The uranium slug is sliding inside the gun barrel. It has to be lubricated by the sperm whale oil. And then at the end, it then runs over and fits around the other bit of uranium at the other end. And bingo, the whole thing goes bang. And sperm whale oil, that was that oil. You see, I've actually got some sperm whale oil, which I got from the Albany in Western Australia whaling station, because the thing about it, and the reason they used it in bombs, was because it was the only oil known to the human race that would not dry out, dry out after days and weeks and months and even years. You could make a uranium bomb, lubricate it with sperm whale oil and put it aside for a few decades, knowing that it would still work. Mind you, we don't have uranium bombs like that anymore. They're obsolete for various reasons, but you got the idea. Conventional chemical explosive, some subcritical bits of uranium-235 come together and there's a bit of whale oil there to do it. By the way, just in case you desperately need to make a nuclear weapon, this is how they make the other sort of atom bomb today, the plutonium bomb. And what happens? is that you have this cylinder, this ball, this sphere, actually it's a sphere of um, plutonium and see that light blue color? That's how big it is. And over here, wherever you see these red star type things, they're specially shaped lenses of high explosive and they're very carefully timed. And then they go off in the right order at the right timing, blah, 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 blah. And they compress that sphere from there 
down to there. And suddenly the plutonium core is compressed and now it is critical, whereas before it was not, and therefore it goes bang. And these uranium bombs, as I said, now you understand what I mean, that sperm whale oil was essential lubricant for this sliding uranium-235 subcritical slug. And people started testing uranium bombs all over the place. They went crazy. Um, and by 1953, they'd even come up with this ridiculous thing, up, shot, not hole, gravel, was the name of the test in 1953. Now, there are definite disadvantages to having an atom bomb explode on top of you or next to you or anywhere all or anywhere on the planet. But back then it was all fresh and new and they were testing atom bombs above ground like there was no tomorrow. So there was a bit of pollution and even the military realized that. So they went underground and there was an unexpected side effect. Now there should be a soundtrack. If there's not, let me know. Now the history books say that the first artificial object launched into space by the human race was the Sputnik satellite. Sputnik was launched by the Soviets on the 4th of October 1957. But according to a magazine called Air and Space, published by the Smithsonian Institution, Sputnik was second. The first object put into space by the human race was an American manhole cover. And it was all part of a nuclear experiment. Since 1957, about 5,000 satellites have been launched into space. There are different types of satellites. Weather, communications, military, scientific and so on. The working life of your average satellite is usually 10 years or less. So most satellites will orbit the Earth for hundreds or thousands of years as space junk. The satellites in low Earth orbits get slowed down by the atmosphere and burn up as they fall to Earth. Ultimately, these satellites do die with dignity as the atmosphere cremates them on re-entry. But before artificial satellites, way back in the mid-1950s, the world was atom crazy. The nuclear nations were boasting about their newfound strength by letting off a nuke every week. This was the wholesome 1950s way that people had fun before colour television. They exploded nukes above ground for everyone to see. Soon the scientists realised that there was a fine layer of radioactive rubbish being carried by the winds around the Earth. Radioactive debris is not your ideal serving suggestion, so the Americans decided to cover up and let the nukes off underground. Bob Brownlee, an astrophysicist, was put in charge of the nuclear experiment. Project Thunderwell, as it was later called, was a really good name. Brownlee had to work out how to restrain the tremendous power of an underground nuclear explosion. Being responsible for a nuclear explosion is like playing with fire. And there is one word that you never want to hear someone say, and that's... Oops. His team drilled a hole about 160 metres deep. Then they carefully lowered a small nuclear device to the bottom. It was equivalent to only a few tonnes of TNT. The team sealed the hole with a manhole cover. It was about 10 centimetres thick and weighed a few hundred kilograms. They started the high-speed cameras and lit the wick on the nuke. The high-speed cameras caught the manhole cover as it began its, until now, secret flight into history. Now, you don't need an atom bomb to launch a manhole cover into space. You don't even need a rocket. According to the laws of physics, if you have a strong enough throwing arm, you could hurl it. All you have to do is chuck it at the escape velocity of planet Earth, about seven kilometres per second. That's ignoring wind resistance. If you throw it at less than seven kilometres per second, it will eventually come back down again. If you can throw it a bit faster than seven kilometres per second, it will go into a low Earth orbit. If you can throw it at about 11 kilometres per second, it will go into a huge orbit around the Earth, much bigger than the orbit of the Moon. And if you can break the 11 kilometre per second barrier, about 40,000 kilometres per hour, it will escape the Earth's gravitational field forever. According to Brownlee's estimate, the manhole cover took off about six times faster, about 66 kilometres per second. That speed would take you from New York to Los Angeles in about one minute, almost as fast as the speed of Hollywood gossip. Not only was that manhole cover moving fast enough to leave the Earth forever, it also escaped the gravitational pull of the sun. That manhole cover went past Pluto many years ago and is our first interstellar ambassador, even if it is slightly radioactive. Now, a word of caution before you start trying to throw rocks, sticks or younger siblings into space. 
hot tennis players have served balls at over 200 kilometers per hour, about 200 times too slow to get into orbit. But with 200 tennis players and one ginormous racket, who knows, the unbeatable ace into space? We can only hope that our neighbors would be kind enough to return the ball. Ah, uh, so yes, back then they actually had, this is really hard to believe, they actually used atom bombs inside artillery pieces as weapons and they'd fire them out and bango, there you go. Now you're thinking, wow, that, that looks um, pretty close, like, you know, a kilometer away. It's actually a 15,000 tons of TNT equivalent bomb as on Hiroshima or Nagasaki, unfortunately. And so it's actually huge and it's 10 kilometers away. And how do they protect the crew? Well, a nice bit of marketing. They call the artillery piece, the artillery gun, the cute name of Atomic Annie. Wow, good luck with that bit of clever marketing to cover up the fact you weren't doing proper occupational health and safety. Now, that's one way of linking whales and explosions and fossil fuels together. But let's check out this way of linking whales and explosions, a true story. It had to be said, the Oregon State Highway Division not only had a whale of a problem on its hands, it had a stinking whale of a problem. What to do with one 45-foot, 8-ton whale dead on arrival on the beach near Florence? It had been so long since a whale had washed up in Lane County, nobody could remember how to get rid of one. In selecting its battle plan, the Highway Division decided the carcass couldn't be buried because it might soon be uncovered. It couldn't be cut up and then buried because nobody wanted to cut it up, and it couldn't be burned. So dynamite it was, some 20 cases or a half ton of it. The hope was that the long-dead Pacific gray whale would be almost disintegrated by the blast, and that any small pieces still around after the explosion would be taken care of by seagulls and other scavengers. Indeed, the seagulls had been standing nearby all day. As everything was being made ready, we asked George Thornton, the highway engineer in charge of the project, for his final observation. Well, I'm confident that it'll work. The only thing is, we're not sure just exactly how much uh, explosives it'll take to disintegrate this thing so the scavengers, seagulls, and crabs and whatnot can clean it up. Is there any chance it might be more than a one-day job? Uh, if there's any large chunks left, and uh, we may have to do some other cleanup, possibly set another charge. The dynamite was buried primarily on the leeward side of the big mammal, so as most of the remains would be blown toward the sea. About 75 bystanders, most of them residents who had first found the whale to be an object of curiosity before they tired of its smell, were moved back a quarter of a mile away. The sand dunes there were covered with spectators and land lubber newsmen, shortly to become land blubber newsmen, with a blast blasted blubber beyond all believable bounds. Our camera stopped rolling immediately after the blast. The humor of the entire situation suddenly gave way to a run for survival as huge chunks of whale blubber fell everywhere. Pieces of meat passed high over our heads while others were falling at our feet. The dunes were rapidly evacuated as spectators escaped both the falling debris and the overwhelming smell. A parked car over a quarter of a mile from the blast site was the target of one large chunk. The passenger compartment literally smashed. Fortunately, no human was hit as badly as the car. However, everyone on the scene was covered with small particles of dead whale. As for the success of the effort, well, the seagulls who were supposed to clean things up were nowhere in sight, either scared away by the explosion or kept away by the smell. That didn't really matter. The remaining chunks were of such a size that no respectable seagull would attempt to tackle anyway. As darkness began to set in, the highway crews were back on the beach burying the remains including a large piece of the carcass which never left the blast site. It might be concluded that should a whale ever wash ashore in Lane County again, those in charge will not only remember what to do, they'll certainly remember what not to do. Wow. But not all dead whales actually wash up on the sand. Some of them are still out at sea. Now, they do say that dead men can walk. That's not true. Well, yeah, yeah. 
but maybe, but how's this for a surprise? Dead whales can swim. Oh my God. Yes, the old whaling journals report of dead whales coasting at about one knot, you know, a bit one and a bit kilometers an hour for long periods of time. And in fact, not only can dead whales swim, well, look at this video. See that fish swimming up to the left there? That fish has been dead for about a day and it's still swimming. What's going on? Well, here's a paper back from 2006 in the Journal of Fluid Mechanics called Passive Propulsion in Vortex Wakes. And look at the first three words of the abstract, a dead fish, right? There you are. So the movement, the swimming of the fish is not caused by biology or physiology, but rather a different branch of science, physics and hydrodynamics. Firstly, let's just prove that it is swimming to the left. So look at it at 3.75 seconds and at 3.9, it's definitely advanced over to the left, 3.9, 4.14, it's definitely going to the left. Let's zoom in on the fish and all you can see is the fish and you can't see the water, you can't see the water. And there's another thing that you cannot see in the water and that's vertical spinning spirals. You can't see them, but they exist and they go downstream. These vortices, these spirals exist. And when one of them comes and hits the tail of a fish, if the tail happens to be a bit sideways, it will ram into it and it will push that tail backwards. And as the tail goes backwards, well, blow me down, some water goes backwards. And then you kick into a bit of physics, Newton's third law. Remember that? For every action, there is an opposite and equal reaction. So if the water goes to the right, the fish goes to the left, the fish or the whale. So where's the energy coming from? Is this magic or perpetual motion? No, the energy comes from the moving water coming downstream. Now, as you know, every show has to have some reference to the movie The Godfather. So here's something about dead fish from The Godfather. And it refers to something bad happening to one of their hitmen, and they get delivered a package, his, a paper bag, and inside the paper bag is the guy's, the dead man's um, bulletproof jacket, and inside that is a fish. So at the beginning of this little clip, they're putting down the new godfather saying, you know, college boy, you don't know much, and then things change. Listen, uh, hang around the house on the floor and be a big help. Huh? Try Luca again. Go ahead. What the hell is this? That's just a sodium message. That means Luca Brassi sleeps with the fishes. Well, at least they had the right sort of music. And so getting back to our friends, the whales, it turns out when they killed the whales in the old days, which is a bad thing, and if there was a decent sort of sea coming towards the whale, head on, the whale could take off at one knot, but also a living whale can get one quarter of the power that it needs to swim in the so-called head sea. Now, the whales have got another thing. You know, they're doing this with a lot of energy. And where, where do we get our energy? Well, you and I, we just eat a bit of food. It's really easy. It's just sitting there all in one concentrated lump. You know, uh, soybeans and vegetables, yum or uh, fried chicken, pick one, it's there on a plate. But whales, you know, the filter feeders, how do those whales get their energy when it's spread out? Swimming away from them, maybe it's dead and uh, maybe it's alive, we don't know, but it's definitely swimming away. And to do this, to get their feed, whales, the filter feeders, they can do this amazing feat of being able to double their weight in three seconds. And we're talking a big whale, like the second biggest whale weighing 60 tons, and he can drink 70 tons of water in three seconds. Oh, my God. And here's the paper from uh, Marine Ecology Progress Series, and it's called Big Papers, Big Gulps Require High Drag for Fin Whale. That's the second biggest whale doing a so-called lunge feeding. Now, you'll notice something about this whale. Notice that underneath its mouth it's got these sort of longitudinal lines and think of them like the pleats on a skirt or the pleats on a piano accordion they can straighten out and expand 
And so the whale sees the krill straight ahead of it and then knows what to do. It opens its mouth up, but wow, that's increasing the drag. And the water comes rushing in, the pleats fold up, and then bingo, it shuts its mouth and then it does the next stage. So in that lousy, incredibly small three seconds, it has doubled its weight. But of course, it's, there's a lot of drag. So it's slowed from 10 kilometers down to two kilometers an hour, even though it's flapping like crazy. So in that little feed, all it gets is 11 kilograms of kill per lunge, of krill per lunge, which means to get its regular feed, like one ton of krill a day, you know, one sixtieth of its body weight, like you and me, it's got to do 80 to 90 lunges. And then it closes its mouth and pushes the water out, 70 tons of water. And you'll notice that hanging off the upper jaw is something called baleen, B-A-L-E-E-N, which looks like this, and it acts as a filter. And it takes them three hours a day to feed when there's lots of food around, but sometimes they can take longer and they can get, because there's not enough food, they get so exhausting from chasing krill that they can actually run out of air while chasing the krill and then end up on a beach like this one. Now, one thing about this beach, forgetting the whale and the reporter, is all that sand. Now, how's this for something weird? There's a lot of sand there, but let me tell you this, folks, we are running out of sand. And you say, what? How can we possibly be running out of sand? Sand is as common as mud. The beaches are full of it. Yes, we are running out of sand. Here's an example. The tallest building in the whole world is the Burj Khalifa in Dubai, 828 metres high. There I am at, at the top of it. That's me, the little blue person. And by the way, if you time it right, and then jump into the elevator, you can get two sunrises and two sunsets in one day. But you've got to time it right. I haven't got around. I haven't managed to do it yet. I'm looking forward to doing it. Okay. So this building is in the desert, surrounded by sand. But why did they not use the desert sand, but instead use the Australian sand? Well, it turns out they had already used up all the sand about half a billion tonnes of all the good sand. So back in 2002, Dubai looked like this. 2012, oh my gosh, you're looking at about a billion tonnes of sand. And there's those locations again, huge areas, huge, absolutely enormous amounts of sand, nearly half a billion tonnes just in the world and at the Palm Jumeirah. Uh, there, it's absolutely amazing. I've never been on it, but imagine getting on and then driving down here and going down, down, down to there, and then a tiny little causeway, then all the way to here, and a tiny little causeway, and then over to there. Oh my God, how are you going to get out? Oh, I guess you just use your personal jet, jet boat. But anyway, to make that took about a third of a billion tons of sand, and we are running out of sand. Why? Well, desert sand is no good. Desert sand is manufactured when air moves at high speed and rubs rocks together. And you've got a mixture of high speed and low pressure. High speed and low pressure gives you grains of sand that are smooth and no good for construction. But marine sand, underwater, the water moves much more slowly, but with high pressure, and it leaves you with a rough surface, which is perfect, not just okay, but perfect for construction. And it's the marine sand that we're running out of. We use this sand for agriculture and manufacturing and fracking. Oh, can you believe that? Some people think that we can solve global warming by burning more methane, okay. And we use it for optic fibers and cosmetics and toothpaste. And the biggest user of all is construction. To build your average US home takes a hundred tons of sand and gravel and crushed stone. For a single kilometre of a single lane of a road, not two lanes, just one lane, 25,000 tonnes of sand. And in 2012, we manufactured enough concrete to build a wall around the equator, 27 metres by 27 metres, 27 high, 27 across, <laughs> and 40,000 kilometres long. And we're using about 10 billion tonnes of sand a year for the whole world. In two years, China used as much as the USA did in the entire 20th century. And there's an interesting lesson here from Singapore. Now, back in the early 1960s, Singapore had a low population and not too much land. And then 
they gradually increased their land more and more by tipping sand there. And you can see from the map, the ready bits are the latest bits, and then the yellow are the second latest, and the green, light green, dark green, so it goes. And so they imported 80 million tons of sand, according to the Singaporean government. But they got it from Cambodia. Cambodia said that they exported from Cambodia to Singapore only 3 million. That is one heck of a rounding error. Something is going on there. In fact, illegal sand mining is totally out of control in 70 states in the whole world. In India and Kenya, you've got hundreds of people dying each decade when the big bad people roll in with automatic weapons and very big uh, earth moving stuff. They take away all the sand. They do, normally do it near a road or a bridge. And then there's nothing holding the bridge up. And when the floods come, the bridge collapse. And in the Mekong Delta, where the mighty Mekong flows in through Vietnam, half a million people are being relocated right now because of illegal sand mining. And there's lots we can do. Lots of alternatives, industrial slag and crushed rot and incinerator acid, even reuse uh, concrete instead of just throwing it in the ground, break it up and then use it again and use clean rubble as a base aggregate. There's a lot of things we can do. If we all do the right thing with regard to sand, we'll all feel fine and dandy and also fine and sandy. So we have a solution to the sand crisis. And we also have a solution to the climate change crisis. All we need are politicians who will commit to doing the right thing right here, right now, because things are getting tight. So let me take you through the history of climate change and wait for it, break your heart here, the cover up. The bottom line, fossil fuel, even after they knew the climate change was happening, deliberately went out of their way via big bribes and big money and uh, big, big money to embed fossil fuels in every part of our society so that we would have difficulty in getting away from it. So in 1856, Eunice Newton Foote, she proved that carbon dioxide absorbed and, and hung onto the heat and she predicted what would happen. By 1938, we were already seeing it, uh, but just a little tiny bit. By 1973, the insurance companies could see global warming in increased floods and storms, which meant that they had to pay out more money. Who are these people? The biggest uh, insurance company in the whole world, Munich Re. In fact, the insurance companies, when it talks about health, they saw that smoking tobacco would make you die sooner. And so they saw this before the medical doctors did, and so if you were a person who smoked cigarettes and you wanted to take out a life insurance policy, they would charge you more money. And in 1973, they recognized the greenhouse effect and once again, they increased the premiums. Why did they increase the premiums? It's not personal, Sonny. It's strictly business. It's not personal, Sonny. It's strictly business. So in 1973, the insurance companies could see global warming happening. And so could, wait for it, the fossil fuel companies. Exxon, the biggest fossil fuel company in the world for a while. Its own scientists have confirmed climate change way back in the 70s. And you had the chief scientist for Exxon saying there is general scientific agreement that we are influencing the global climate through carbon dioxide release. 1977. And Exxon was worried and said, this is terrible. We, we, we're convinced. So they, let's spend lots of money. And they got lots of climate scientists and these fancy machines called computer machines. I think we call them computers today. And they teamed up with all the other big fossil fuel companies in the world and set up the carbon dioxide and climate change task force in 1980. 1980, remember that year. 1982, they had a big meeting. They were prepared to come out with their brief summary of exactly what was going on about carbon dioxide and warming up the world. And here is a photograph from that meeting. And you can see the two slide projectors on the screen. And look at that carbon dioxide greenhouse effect. Um, and if you look at this slide, you'll see on the right hand side, there's a graph. Let's just dive into that graph and dive into the bottom of that graph. And here you can see the years 1980, 2000, 2020, 
And over there, you can see an arrow saying, okay, so something's going to, we predict, this is what we predict for the year 2020. What did they predict? They predicted that carbon dioxide levels would be about 415 parts per million. Wow. That's so close. And they predicted that the temperature would be about one degree higher. They predicted this 38 years before it happened. They knew back then, and they've been covering it up. And, but back then, in 1980, they weren't covering it up yet. They decided, in fact, to not develop the largest gas field on Earth, one in the South China Sea, because while it did contain 30% methane, it contained 70% carbon dioxide and by itself accounted for 1%, would, would account for 1% of all carbon dioxide emissions in the whole world. And it would have been the largest single point emitter of carbon dioxide on the entire planet. And as good corporate citizens, they decided to not develop this. After all, they used to be good corporate citizens. They saved the whales from extinction, which is what happened to the pterosaurs. And then it all changed in 1990. In 1990, the climate scientists said, we've got enough proof to say not only that climate change is real, we knew that in 77, but we now have enough data to start telling you what sort of bad things are happening. And as we get more data, we get to know more of it. And in the same year, the fossil fuel companies chucked a Yui, disbanded their scientific report and turned the scientific group and turned it into a lobby group to keep burning fossil fuels at all levels from uh, industry to state to federal and even local councils. Why? We don't know. We don't have the emails. But here's my guess, my conjecture, my hypothesis. Now, these people are basically energy companies. They might have been selling liquids or solids but or gas, but they're selling energy. Option one, change into companies that would still sell energy, but, but they'd be moving out of fossil fuels, which was new territory. And this could be risky. Or... Option B, BAU, business as usual, keep on pumping it out of the ground, digging it up, and spend a lot of money, up to a billion dollars a year, funding a denialist campaign like Big Tobacco has done. Right. And um, a little bit later, the Royal Society wrote a letter to Exxon saying, stop telling lies. And here's the sort of lies they were telling. In 1978, they were saying, look, there's general scientific agreement that global warming is real. 20 years later, they said, nah, look, look, they, they, they disagree with each other. One person says 1.12 degrees, and the other one says 1.13. They can't both be right, so obviously they're both wrong. And then another one, they, in 78, they said, we've got to do stuff before things get bad. Like, for example, you might end up with something like Sydney being the hottest place on Earth on the 4th of January with temp this last year with temperatures just under 50 degrees C or one-fifth of all the forests in Australia burning, including rainforests, which have never burned. Whereas in 1977, Lee Raymond said, look, it's not gonna make any difference because climate change is not real anyway. By the way, when he left, he walked out with $400 million as a bonus. So what we've had is these big fossil fuel companies, they've embedded fossil fuels into our society, knowing that climate change was real. And they have done one of the worst things that you can do. You can make people scared to bring children into the world. They're treating the world like it's their little toy, just so a couple of dozen big companies can get fabulously wealthy. Anyhow, Royal Society wrote a letter to Exxon saying stop telling lies, and they still kept on funding lots of organisations, including in Australia, and you can read the article by the head of the Australian Petroleum Production and Exploration Association in the Herald on last uh, Thursday or Wednesday, about how we really need to keep on burning fossil fuels to avoid climate change. So they're, they're getting money from Exxon as well. And the fossil fuel industry has spent billions to control how people think. And in just one country alone, they spent $3.6 billion on advertisements over a 20 year, 30 year period. And in Congress, they've been lobbying billions of dollars to get to influence people. So. How do we end up in 2010? Well, in 2010, Exxon was doing really well. This, this you know, bargain with the devil was paying off. They had the highest market capitalization, which is another way of saying they were the wealthiest country on earth, on the Dow Jones index in New York or in America. And they were doing well. 
on the same day that they reached the highest wealth, that was the day that Elon Musk launched Tesla. Let's roll forward a few years to 2013, and the International Monetary Fund then reached, put out a report. Now, these are very hard-nosed people. These are not your lefty pinko cafe latte uh, decaf with a twist of lemon and some soy and some kombucha thrown in and a little bit of chai as well. No, these are people who say, look, we'll only lend you money if you uh, just close down all your hospitals because they're too expensive. And the International Monetary Fund in 2013 released a paper called Energy Subsidy Reform. Energy is energy. Subsidy, well, what does subsidy mean? Subsidy means free money. And in 2011, the uh, subsidies, the free money, by the way, if it's, they have to give the money back, it's called an investment. The subsidies, the free money from all of the governments of the world to big fossil fuel add up to $1.9 trillion dollars which out of about $85 trillion for the global GDP is about 2.5%, but more scarily, was equal to 8% in 2011 of all government revenues over the entire planet, which is more than the world military budget. The fossil fuels were getting 8% of all the money generated by all of the governments in the world. And when was the last time you saw a fossil fuel company organising a lamington sale on a Saturday morning at your local primary school. But then you think, oh, come on, there must have been benefits from all of this. You know, the economy must have got better. And the International Monetary Fund, them, they said the exact opposite. Giving 8% of all the money earned by governments to the fossil fuel companies for free depressed economic growth. It actually made our economy worse. It made people poorer. It was bad for the environment. Hey, one-fifth of all the forests in Australia burnt. And it was bad for society and health. I'll come back to health in a second. But let's see what happened after 2013. Well, in 2019, they released another report, which said basically that global fossil fuel subsidies remain large. They're still up there at 8%. What will happen in another six years by 2025? Well, it'll change because of the concept of stranded assets, which I'll talk to you about in a second. But getting back to this report that they were bad for the environment and society and health, it turns out that they killed people, one fifth of everybody who died. You see, there's about 45 million people that die every year just from various causes. And fossil fuels kill one fifth of them earlier than they would have died. And they die from air pollution, and they've got terrible lung diseases, and they are expensive to the company, expensive to the state, expensive to the family. They are bad for everybody except the fossil fuel companies, who, on top of all their fabulous profits, get 8% of all the money generated by all the governments in the world. Okay, how's it playing out in 2020? Well, back in 2010, they were very wealthy. And Tesla, well, by 2020, Tesla was now worth more than the next five biggest car companies in the whole world, whereas Exxon had started to go bad and had been booted out from this blue chip barometer and been replaced by other companies that were working in renewables, the biggest producer of wind and solar power. Now, suppose you had $1,000 in 2010 and you invested it in next era. Well, you would have got $6,000 back after 10 years, but with Exxon, 750. Exxon's going bad. And in the first half of 2020, Next Era had a net profit of 1.7 billion, Exxon a net loss of 1.7 billion. And what is Exxon going to do about it? They're going to increase drilling. Here's the Financial Times of London, the slow death of big oil. Now it's time to talk stranded asset. What's a stranded asset? Well, think about shipping in the time of Captain Cook. If you owned a factory that made sail, you were onto a sweet thing, baby, because you would make lots of money until they invented the steam engine. And even though you still made really good sales, the money was being made by the steam engine factories and your sail factory was a standard asset. And steam was the way to go until it became a stranded asset because of diesel engines. And they will become a stranded asset because of hydrogen engines and batteries and fuel cells and all that sort of stuff. Fossil fuel is rapidly becoming a stranded asset. Nothing personal about it. 
business is business. Like, it's nothing personal. Business is business. Like, it's nothing personal. But they're still trying to make some money. Uh, and so that's why uh, Australia is saying that it is the best in the world at dealing with climate change action, whereas the United Nations says it's the worst. And while we're going to invest more in coal and in uh, other fossil fuels. So I've covered the history of climate change and cover up, moving through into where the heat comes from, from global warming. It turns out that um, the heat comes from the sun because carbon dioxide acts like a one-way valve. It lets the heat come in, but it doesn't let it go out. How much heat is trapped? A lot. How much is trapped in a single day? 400,000 Hiroshima bombs worth of heat per day. You can get away with that for a day or a week or a month or a year or a decade. Do it for a few decades, you'll end up burning one fifth of all the forests in Australia. Why did we burn fossil fuels? Well, a really good reason, they're loaded with energy. Suppose you've got a labourer, you know, $50,000 a year is what they cost in Australia. You've got a labourer and you want him to shift some bricks from the bottom of the hill to the top of the hill. Well, that'll take a certain amount of energy. How much energy is there in a barrel of oil, which is about $50? The amount of energy in a barrel of oil is equal to the energy of a labourer working for 10 years. $500,000 or $50, pick one. That's why we burn fossil fuels. The effects of climate change, we've, besides everything else, we've tipped the earth off its axis. And I'm working up a story about how we've actually made the days shorter. And how do we fix climate change? The good news is that we can fix it. Read this document here, the drawdown review. It's quite small. It'll take you about, took me about five hours to read. And it comes up with climate changes for a new decade, which are in three parts of bring the emissions to zero and then start sucking the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere into sinks. And that will lead to an improvement in society. So we can go to zero emissions and start removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere back to 20th century levels and bring the climate and the carbon dioxide levels back to what they were in the 20th century, back to the way they were and go to drawdown.org. If you want a local Australian slant, look at bze.org.au and they've come out with this brilliant document called Zero Carbon Australia Research. Uh, the Million Jobs Plan, and it deals with a whole bunch of different parts of our economy. We can change coal mines in Western Australia and take energy from the central part of the Australian outback and export overseas. We work in all sorts of areas. And the good thing about um, renewable energies is that they've got huge numbers of jobs. And best of all, those jobs are local. There's none of this flying in, flying out where you destroy families. There is a lot that can be done at a personal level, you and me, and local government and state government. But the really effective action in this case needs federal action. And here is Pearl Harbor, 7th of December, 1941. Until that day, in the previous half century, America had built 3,000 aeroplanes. They went in boots and all at a federal level and in the next four years built 300,000 aeroplanes, big aeroplanes like this, huge 30 tonne planes, very fast, very powerful engines, huge range. And they got the car manufacturers just to start making them. And Ford built just one factory, just one of the factories that Ford built turned out to be the largest single story building in the whole world. They built this fresh on virgin land and it was a kilometre long by a third of a kilometre wide. And they could pump out these planes, not one a week, not one a month, one every hour. And these planes, instead of 15,000 parts, like a car back then had, had 500,000 parts. They were made with high-tech materials and they were, had to be built by skilled workers and are pumping them out at one an hour. And you're saying, but hang on, Carl, you're trying to tell me that the fossil fuel companies would lie to me? Well, look at this. In August in 2018, this poster on the left appeared in every hospital in Australia, a huge A3 glossy poster, shortly afterwards reported, replaced by the other poster. And it said, the poster on the left in the first paragraph, it is not known if alcohol is safe to drink while you are pregnant. That is a complete lie. 
and has known to be a lie for about a third of a century. Why do they do that? We have, the exact opposite is true. It is known that alcohol is unsafe to drink while you are pregnant. Why did the alcohol industry do this? Well, there, the trouble was that their sales needed a bit of boosting. And there were these people called pregnant women who, for some crazy reason, were not having babies uh, while drinking alcohol. It was either one or the other, drink alcohol or be pregnant, but not both at the same time. And um, big alcohol didn't specifically want these pregnant women to give birth to babies that were physically deformed and mentally retarded. No, they just wanted to make a bit of extra money. It's not personal, son. It's strictly business. Nothing personal. It was just money. And so we can go zero carbon for the whole world in 10 years for steel and concrete in 10 years. They, steel and concrete each account for about 8% of global emissions. Um, car, transport, 15 years, zero carbon uh, for livestock and agriculture, 15, 20 years. There's nothing scientific stopping us. There's no new technology we need. We've already got the technology. We just need the political will. Now, many of you want things to go back the way they were in the 20th century, and we can do it. It is not too late. And here's some more good news. We can fix the COVID pandemic. Now, you recognize this guy here with the spike sticking out of it, looking like a little crown, so hence coronavirus. Now, many of you will say, oh, but I have heard that vaccines cause autism. No, that's Elle McPherson's boyfriend who said that, and he's been deregistered as a medical doctor. But in fact, the exact opposite is true. You see, with regard to autism, and vaccines, it turns out that a lot of sort of science people, there seems to be a bit of you know, autism spectrum there, a bit more than the average society, which means that not that vaccines cause autism, but people with autism cause vaccines and they save babies. Haha, <laughs> joke. So now I'll finish off with a bit of good news. And this is how we can fix everything with COVID-19 and get things back to the way they were in the 20th century. Vaccine victory, the, now, here, now here it comes. The most widely used vaccine on planet Earth is used against the coronavirus. And it's been given for half a century. And every year it saves billions of lives. And you're thinking, hang on, there's only about seven or eight billion people on the planet. How can it save billions of lives? It saves billions of lives of chickens. And there's a great lesson for us. Way back in 1937, the first known coronavirus, well, it changed. And suddenly it could infect chickens. It could infect 100% of a flock of chickens within 24 hours and kill them with pneumonia or kidney disease. This was very scary. If you had a flock of chickens and they got infected, all you could do was kill them, burn the bodies, dig a hole in the ground and bury them and hope it didn't spread to the other chickens nearby. So there was a lot of pressure to develop a vaccine and they didn't have the science that we have today. So it took them a while, but half a century ago, they had the first vaccine. Situation today, around the world, there are about 500 different varieties of this coronavirus that wants to kill chickens. You let near a chicken, it's a dead chicken. But to stop it, we've got a bit less than a hundred vaccines against this disease. By the way, there's lots of chickens on the planet. And the total weight of chickens is more than the weight of all the other birds put together. Getting back. So how do we do this thing? How do we fix this chicken thing? Every single commercial chicken is vaccinated on the day it hatches and then two weeks and four weeks. They spray the vaccine in the air and then um, the, some of it lands in their mouth. They breathe in, but some on their feathers and they preen their feathers and then it goes in their mouth. So that's how they get the vaccine into them. And if we did not vaccinate virtually all the commercial chickens on earth, there'd be no fried chicken. I know almost as bad as not having fried soybeans or steamed vegetables, that's where I'm standing. And so we can do the same thing for humans. We need to do it. As of three hours ago, this is how many people were infected according to the best figures we have. They're not, they're not perfect, but they're the best we got, 200 million. About 4 million were dead. And about four and a half million or billion cases of does the vaccine have been given. And if you don't go looking into it, you can see going back to when it started last year, 
Uh, the weekly cases are going up and down and up and down, 5 million a year, 4 million a year. We're heading into the third wave worldwide. Victoria's had its fifth or sixth wave. New South Wales going into its second wave. You guys are lucky. You got zero waves. Number of deaths uh, heading into the third wave worldwide. Vaccine coming on now. And thank heavens we got the vaccine. Right. So what will happen for us humans is that every year you will get, maybe twice a year, the a bunch of vaccines against whatever current strains are around, which sounds just like the flu shot. And you go to the GP, but here's where things are different in a few years from now. You will have your own personal DNA. And the GP will say, ah, Ollie, Dr. Ollie, I can see that in your immune system, you've got certain strengths and weaknesses. Okay, let me take account of that. And let me also take account of the fact of where you live now and where you will be in the near future over the next six months. And then the doctor will switch on the 3D printer in their office. And within 10 minutes, it will print out a bunch of COVID-19 vaccines tailored for you and your various locations you'll be going to, and you just have to get topped up every six months. So we can, this will happen fairly soon. We humans can gain vaccine victory by following the impeccable example of the chickens and their dozens of vaccines. We won't have to wing it. Oh, thank you very much. And I look forward to answering any questions that you may have. Thank you very much for coming in today. Thank you. And coming out of this, over to you, Dr. Ollie. Thank you very much. I hope you can hear the applause here. Um, I feel very honored to be the vaccine example there. Um, so now we have the exciting Q&A session. So hopefully that gave you lots to think about. And also you may have some questions that you came prepared with that you want to ask Dr. Carl. So what we'll do, the way it will work, is that for those of you here, you'll come line up. We've got a microphone ready for you. If you want to ask, but for some that you want to stay in your seat, we can also do that. We can come to you. But otherwise, please come line up. Hope you've got some great questions ready. And also for those of you on Zoom land, you can also ask questions. I have my laptop here. So I'll see your questions pop up in the Q&A box. So pop them in there, start them coming. Um, but yeah, over to you guys. If anyone wants to be brave and get the ball rolling, please come on down. I can answer the first question, Dr. Ollie. Yeah. Uh, my wife makes my shirt. My shirt. It takes about three or four hours with a fourth thread overlocker with differential feed. And of course, I have two pockets, one on each side. Oh, there you go. <laughs> yes. Come on. Okay. Please say your name if you would like to. Hi, Dr. Carl. My name's Natalie. Dr. Natalie, nice to meet you. <laughs> I have an unrelated question to everything. I just wanted to know why some people have internal monologues and other people don't. Aha, and why do we, all of us, drift off into dreamland and just find ourselves staring at nothing every now and then? And why do we dream? And there's a bunch of theories about why we dream, and I think it might and this is purely a conjecture because I have no proof, be related to the internal monologue. You see, we humans seem to just love telling stories and listening to them. Radio, TV, online, books, meeting somebody, telling them a joke, et cetera, et cetera. And one theory, and I don't know how good this is, one, sorry, not a theory, because after all, we do know, Dr. Natalie, that a theory is a full and complete explanation. One guess is that the reason we tell so many stories all the time is to keep our brains loose and limber and not too specialised. So I can talk to you and then stand up without falling over, and then pick up a glass and then have a little quick drink and then keep on thinking about this thing while walking down the road all at the same time. Whereas any of those actions could be done better by a robot if you spend enough money, but doing all of those. So that is one of our strengths as humans. And that's, a, that's the best answer I got. Dr. Ollie, what do you reckon about why some people have this internal monologue and some people don't? 
Oh, wow. <laughs> Over to you, Ellie. Gosh, yeah. I mean, my internal monologue is pretty much on 100% of the time. So I have it just to entertain myself. I can't imagine living without it. So uh, I, feel, I don't know what. internal monologue say? Pardon? Well, what is your internal monologue uh, saying, for like, uh, example, now? Oh, it's pretty much narrating my life as a sitcom. So right now I'd probably do a montage or as each person comes down and asks a quick fire question. And speaking, oh, sorry, you can no, go for it now. No. Oh, okay. Dr. Carl, I don't have an internal monologue. I don't have any like a flow of words in my head. So I don't really relate to other people saying they have an internal monologue. And I like, why don't I have an internal monologue? <laughs> Well, maybe you do in a way that you don't recognise as them. Like they're not thinking. I went down the street today, and there I saw a cabbage lying in the gutter. Cruel young boys had chased it there with a stick and beaten it to death. Well, whereas most of us go, oh, yeah, nice day, yeah, walking around. Um, I, I tend to think, in my case, most of the time, I'm not doing anything. I'm not thinking. You know, I, like there's, there's there's nothing going on. You know, I'm just idling away, and then only when I decide to do something, or actually do anything, and then I think like writing a story or like a show tonight. But most of the time, mate, there's nobody home. <laughs> I, I've got a pulse and, and I'm breathing. Uh, that, that's kind of about it, mate. No. Sure. I agree on my behalf as well. Yeah. Thanks, Dr. Carl. Oh, Thank you, Dr. Thanks. <laughs> thanks, Nat. And perhaps your life is exciting enough that you don't need an internal monologue. Okay, so we have some questions coming in. Um, online we've got two that are actually very similar so yep. dr levi and esther and henry jordan they've asked very similar questions so how on earth do you 3d print a covid vaccination well basically there's two ways of making stuff in engineering top down bottom up and so top down, you start off with a big block of marble and you liberate from within it the statue that's always been there waiting for you to bring it out. Or you start off with little things and you join them together and start going from the bottom up. And so the first 3D printers were called rapid prototypers because they were rapid at making prototypes. What of? high heel shoes. Back in the mid-1980s, it took an, um, a week and a half and $1,500 for a skilled craft person to make just one high heel shoe. But they worked out that they could lay down a thin layer of a special resin and then shine upon it an ultraviolet laser beam, which would then harden under the control of a thing called a computer that they had back then into a certain pattern. Then they add another third of a millimetre and then keep going and harden it again and work up. And then that cost about $200 and it took about three hours. And then they could look at it in their hands, say wider, taller, sort of whatever. And so it spread from there to where we are today in 2020, where the two main divisions of 3D printers, uh, you've got the little home ones, which are about the size of a microwave oven, a bit bigger. And they can make polylactic acid. They, the feedstock is polylactic acid, and they can make cute little figures of Yoda. What's not to like? And then you've got the big ones that fill three air conditioned rooms, and they can make things, for example, um, they've made uh, a machine which is roughly the size of my head 22,000 of these machines, which can survive an environment of a wind of 1,000 kilometers an hour and an air temperature of 1500 degrees C. These are fuel pumps inside a jet engine. In the old days, they used to make them out of this bit of metal and screw it onto there and then weld it onto there and then tap it and then shrink fit it and everything else. And it cost about $5 million and took about three months. Now they print them for $1 million and it takes about three weeks. So they're just spraying different layers of metal. Just recently, the first home 3D printers are now coming that can deal with something other than polylactic acid. So in the future, you will have in your house a 3D printer, which will have as its feedstock the 92 or so elements of the periodic table, 
and you'll order a phone and you'll pay for it. And then your 3D printer will start going away and in the morning you wake up and there it is with atoms of silicon and oxygen and hydrogen and tantalum and, tan and so forth. And so we are getting skilled at making these 3D printers stitch together individual molecules, individual atoms. I think you need an atomic force microscope, but individual molecules, sure. And if you look at the um, coronavirus itself, it's got a, about a molecular weight of about 40,000. It's not that big. So you can, there'd be a bunch of molecules. And the vaccine, well, we, we're already manufacturing two sorts of vaccine. One is the AstraZeneca type, which is the old school, like either a killed virus or disabled or weakened or a fragment of the virus. And then we've got the Pfizer and the Moderna, which is they make messenger RNA. They make the code. They make a bunch of chemicals. And that can be shrunken down into something that you can make in a 3D printer. Well, I mean, 10 minutes is a long time. If you've got a big factory, you want to pop them out every five seconds. But in a doctor's surgery, they'll say, yeah, hang around for 10 minutes, and I'll inject it into you. Next. So uh, this is something we're working on. And uh, with a bit of luck, Australia will decide to adopt this uh, technology and stop relying on dirt that it sells out of the ground to remain wealthy. Wow. Fab. Cool. Well, we've got another question from our audience. Take it away. Hi, Dr. Carl. My name is Gabby. My question is about climate change. And I'm just wondering, as a typical family, what do you think would be five things we can do in the way we operate to help with climate change? Um, the most effective thing that you can do is, of course, yeah, reduce, recycle, etc. And get yeah, solar panels on your roof. But really, the amount of stuff that the individual person can do is dwarfed by what the federal government can do. So the next layer of things you can do, and I talk about this in my book, Dr. Carl's Little Book of Climate Change Science, the next level of thing you can do is where you put your superannuation money. That's very effective. And lastly, where you put your vote. If they do not have a good policy that you like on climate change, they do not get your vote. Simple as that. Or run for politics as I did in 2007 and failed and learned a lot. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Hi, Dr. Carl, not Dr. Not Dr. Alex here. Um, I just have a question about your presentations in general and what you choose to present in them. I know science philosopher Nick Bostrom characterized um, probably what you've presented with the nuclear bombs, which I found entertaining as uh, information hazard, that being something that if shared could lead to some harm. Do you do some kind of ethical calculation whenever you present your presentations or do you just present whatever you find interesting? Uh, there are certain things that I will not present and there are certain things that I will not say. Um, but with regard to making nuclear weapons, the cat's out of the bag a long time ago. Suppose. On the other hand, we do not know the formula for Coca-Cola. That is still, that secret is still kept. So yes, I definitely go through an ethical process. Is there anything in particular that goes through your mind when you consider it? Um, yes. Um, uh, will this lead to the ultimate betterment of people? Hmm. Uh, the greatest good for the greatest number is my sort of average driving philosophy. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, it's fairly shallow, sorry. No, <laughs> thanks for the question. Right, I'm gonna ask one from our Zoom audience because quite a few are coming in. We've got one sort of related to Nat's question from Tani. Will we one day be able to record our dreams? Um, yes, but that day could be a century or two off into the future. The human, yeah, yeah, yes, maybe. How about that? Definitely, maybe, but no sooner than 50 years. I can't see it sooner than 50 years and possibly never. Yeah. Uh, on the other hand, 
um, we will be able to blend electronics and humans together. I'm looking for, I wish I could live long enough to have a quantum computer embedded in my brain. Mm -hmm. So a definite maybe there are. Oh, great. I would love to be able to record my dreams because they're basically like a film. Okay, we've got an audience question. Go for it. Um, I'm sorry. Um, do you have any idea of what like COVID vaccines are made out of? Ah, uh, yes. If you go onto my Twitter feed, you will find a list uh, in a recent Twitter, the recent tweet that I did. So just Dr. Carl, um, D O C T O R K R L. And this is um, uh, from an article, I'm retweeting an article from the New York Times, when they go through the list of what's actually in um, the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccines. And I, I, I'm kind of a, a bit upset because what I actually have had two doses of the AstraZeneca vaccine and my 5G performance hasn't improved at all. But finally mm -hmm. today I worked it out. The reason is that there's so many people already vaccinated in my area and they're chewing up all the bandwidth. So I want to make sure I get the booster shot as soon as possible. So at least for a little while, I'll be able to get better 5G performance based on the fact that there are 5G chips claimed to be in the vaccines, but they're not, of course, they're lying about that. Uh, with regard to vaccines, do we know everything in them? Mate, we don't know what's in an apple. So I, I just take the vaccines. Oh, I'm very happy to take it. But that's only based on um, me having 28 years of education for free, including 16 years at university. Uh, that's probably not as much as Kevin on Facebook. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thanks, guys. So another one from online um, related to something that you spoke about earlier. But how are countries working on combating space junk? Very badly. I've written some articles about this. So uh, type in your search engine, ABC, Dr. Carl, space junk. And I've written a four part series about it. And we're just a little bit away from the Kessler syndrome, K E W S L E R. Holly, did you see that movie, Gravity? Pardon? Ollie, did you yes. see that movie called Gravity? Yes. Right. So that's the Kessler syndrome there, where one bit of space junk hits another bit and it creates two bits, and then you've got four and eight and 16, and it just keeps on going. And we're not quite there at that stage, but we're getting dangerously, not, not, not dangerously close, but we should do something about it so sooner. What are we doing to combat it? Not a lot. I do know some people in Australia who are coming up with wonderful inventions such as a tether a rope, a skinny rope, that is electrically conductive. And then when the spacecraft comes to the end of its life, the, the rope, the electrically conductive rope is paid out towards the direction of the Earth vertically. And as it travels, it cuts the magnetic field lines, which enormously slows it down, and then it will come down. There are other different ways we have got of going up to actually get the space junk, either a big space tug, which picks up this big lump and that big lump, or there's another idea where you have a big mesh that just goes through space and picks up all the small stuff, or if you've got something of moderate size and it's going along like this, you shine a laser beam there on a nose and it vaporizes it and stuff goes that way, you insert the law of action reaction, it slows down, goes into a lower orbit, deorbits. It is a problem. Look up the in uh, Wikipedia the phrase tragedy of the commons. We have a shared resource that we can all benefit from and are benefiting from, but nobody is trying to preserve it for the future. Hmm. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> hey, read. Hi, Dr. Carl. Uh, my question is about the chicken vaccines and how they apply it to the chickens from your um, talk before. Um, do they? Mm -hmm. Do we uh, use that for any other animals and could we apply it to humans? I don't know. I'm not an immunologist. Um, I think you. the trouble with the chicken vaccine being sprayed is you get a fair bit of variation in how much of the vaccine each chicken got, whether it be... 10 micrograms or 50, you know, like it might vary over that sort of scale. Whereas when you get injected, mate, you're getting a certain amount, plus or minus half a percent. 
So it could be done for humans, but just thinking off the top of my head, uh, that's the wrong thing. Um, Dr. Ollie, as a um, mm. you know sciencey person, can, can you sort of think of any disadvantages of just spraying the vaccine in the air? Oh. Yeah, the, the things that you're not targeting, probably you don't know the, how it's going to be affecting it. So, yeah, you don't really want the side effects knocking on something else. Good point. I hadn't even thought of that. Yeah, and, and there's probably a, a better one. I, I, I kind of think that the syringe, or well, we do have a new form of syringe where the needles, instead of one big needle, like half a millimetre in diameter, you've got about 100 needles, 100 times smaller, and you can't feel it. Apparently, mm -hmm. that's what I want. So I was very happy to have it. Go and check out my performance on uh, TikTok, and that got half a million views. Whereas my found poem um, got only five thousand. Hoo hoo. On the other hand, <laughs> my totally non-intellectual um, song about getting vaccinated, which where I try to channel my inner punk, that got fifty thousand. Mm, bummer. <laughs> Well, you're much better on technology than I am. I don't even have TikTok. <laughs> okay. Um, TikTok was what I'm getting into because of the people who subscribe to TikTok, one third, uh, sorry, well, yeah, one third are under the age of 14 and two thirds are female. They're the next people coming through. If you don't tell them truth and honesty and wisdom, other people will tell them lies and it's your fault. There you are. No, well, I'll download TikTok I'm later. Laying your heavy on your man. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So another one online, um, mm. and it's a bit of a fun one, and it doesn't help the yeah. fact that my stomach has been rumbling since you mentioned fried chicken. But mm. why does fruit toast cook faster than normal toast? Ah, so you're a big fan of AFL? Me? Yes, I am. Uh, you have your favourite team that you follow? Brisbane Lions. Right. Well, besides now, my, my own team. My daughter is such a fan that she can recognise each of the players in the Sydney Swans by their arm muscles. Wow. <laughs> yeah, I know. And so I've been sucked into the world of AFL. Okay, so what, what, what was the question again? Okay, so <laughs> why does fruit toast cook faster than normal toast? Because along the way you've got little pieces of fruit and they have a higher specific heat than the uh, bread and they also have a higher conductivity let me give you an example you wake up on a freezing tasmanian more uh, morning you're unlucky enough not to have double glazing mm. but you get out of bed and that's, that's nice and you walk or stumble slowly across the carpet which is quite nice. And then you step on the tiles in the bathroom, which are at the same temperature as the carpet, 10 degrees C, but they feel colder because they can store more heat and the heat can travel into them more quickly. So the pieces of fruit, when they're hit by the infrared radiation, they can store more of that heat and then pass it on to the bits of dough around them, so you end up with little burnty bits around the fruit toast, which is a challenge. I have trouble with that, but luckily I'll put Vegemite on it, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> Fair enough. Now we're almost out of time, which is a shame because we have so many questions, but we also have one more from the audience. Is it a short question? Or can you make it short? <laughs> okay, go for it. Hello again, Dr. Carl. Um, I just wanted to ask whether or not you believe that um, the articles in the news that are claiming that something has been scientifically proven um, are problematic for our society, given that science doesn't really prove things necessarily. Sure. Um, so, uh, yes and no. Um, I tend to look through the newspapers just to find out what people are reading. I, I always read the Murdoch press just to find out what the crazy people are thinking or what the Murdoch people are trying to uh, brainwash people into. It's quite distressing sometimes, but also a bit of fun. But I don't trust the reporting in the media. I will trust the peer-reviewed journals. Sometimes they're wrong, but I will tend to trust them. But then you're getting into the whole uh, argument of 
Can you prove anything? And then you get into that philosopher and you start saying that you can only disprove things, you can't prove anything. But if the scientists are telling me that we can, for example, see with our telescopes only 5% of the universe and that 25% is dark matter, which we cannot detect except by its gravitational effect. And they also tell us that 70% um, of the universe is dark energy. Sure, I'll go along with that. I'm not an expert in anything. I'll go along with the average overwhelming opinion of any field of science. So if the hematologists start talking about microcytic anemia, I'm thinking of iron. Or if the metallurgists tell me that if I want to turn iron ore into steel, I have to add carbon to get rid of the oxygen, then oxygen to get rid of the carbon. And then finally, um, 8 to 18% of chrome and nickel to turn into stainless steel. And if they all say that, I'll go along with it. So I'm not an expert in anything. I, I, I just tend to go along with the average overwhelming scientific opinion. What, 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 do you do that? Or I mean, what's your, your feeling on it? I would say, yeah, that's an appropriate way of going about things. It's just sometimes when the news says this is absolutely true and then their link is, you know, oh, my nan said so, it kind of doesn't really hold up. Well, there's another problem there with the uh, political side is that the uh, politicians refuse to put error bars on something. So when a, sci a scientist does not get a Nobel Prize for saying something has a value of 20, they get it for saying it has a value of 20 with a 99.99999% confidence that the real value is between 19.9 .9 and 20.1. Whereas I think it'd be ever so much fun if politicians would say something like, well, this new infrastructure that I propose will cost $2 billion with a 99% confidence that the true cost will be between six and $8 billion. Something like that. Cool. Thank you. Fabulous. Thank you. thank you, Dr. Carl. And thank you to everyone that sent in questions. Sorry, but we are out of time, um, which is a shame. So if you could all please give another round of applause for Dr. Carl, speaker. Um, hopefully everyone's clapping at home as well. So thank you as well to everyone that set up the event. There's been a whole tech team behind the scenes and an organizing team, as well as some volunteers. Thank you all for coming this evening and thank you to everyone tuning in. Also shout out to my parents watching in the UK. Um, and so this is just the beginning of Science Week. We have a whole week of events going on. So tomorrow there's an MPRED lab event in the town hall. It's awesome. It's an immersive field site. You can go in, look at seals and penguins and you can smell them, check out the lab. On Monday, there's a science and poetry event at Grinners. On Tuesday, there's a climate field, um, climate field work film festival. And I'm part of it, spoiler. On um, Wednesday, there's a science made bearable event at Shambles. And on Saturday, there's the festival of bright ideas and tickets are still open for that one, as well as a ton of Beaker Street events. So go to scienceweek.net.au to check them out. And I hope you all have a lovely evening filled with maybe not an internal monologue, but hopefully lovely dreams about science. Thank you for coming. Thank you.